looked at a psalm that comes from a group of prayers, psalms that are kind of a problem for Bible teachers. We call them the psalms of imprecation, prayers in which the psalmist calls down judgment, curses on his enemies. Prayers like this, Psalm 10, break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Psalm 58, O God, break the teeth in their mouth. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. Psalm 137, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Psalm 140, as the head of those who surround me, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into fire, into miry pits, no more to rise. When I first taught wisdom literature in the college, I really struggled with these psalms. How do I stand there and tell college students that, oh God, break their teeth is part of the same scripture that includes blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I talked to people about what to do. One person said, just skip those psalms and hope the students don't notice. Someone else said, tell them it's the Old Testament. The New Testament is different. That sounded good until I read in Paul some words that sounded a lot like the psalms. 2 Timothy 4, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord reward him according to his works. So in the New Testament, we have this same style of imprecation. But in the years since I started studying these psalms, I've come to value them because they help us to respond when the bad guys are winning, when our enemies are winning. Now by the bad guys, I don't mean someone who voted differently than me in the county commission election. I don't mean someone who believes a little differently than me on some issue. I'm not even talking about those who repent and ask forgiveness. I mean those who willfully wrong us, who bring pain into our life, and who never admit they're wrong, never seek forgiveness. Because in this world there are going to be some hurts that come, real hurts. And these psalms teach us something about how to respond to those who wrong us and show no remorse. Tonight I want to look at an example, Psalm 69, that shows us three things to do when the bad guys seem to be winning. The first thing it tells us is that when the bad guys are winning, we can be honest with God. David is honest about his pain. Listen to his description of his situation. Psalm 69, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep water and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim while waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. He'll continue this down in verse 7. He doesn't sugarcoat his situation. David's prayers are honest. I think we are sometimes afraid that if we're very honest in our prayers, we'll offend God which is a little foolish because he can see our hearts, so he already knows how we feel. But I've sometimes imagined God listening to our spoken prayers while at the same time he's reading our inner thoughts. And I think he hears something like this. Out loud we are saying, Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, Thou seest that Tom has mistreated me, but I must not judge. So I ask that thou wouldst bless him. Meanwhile, God can see that what we're thinking inside is, Lord, how could that jerk treat me that way? Do something about this. Don't let him get by with it. David prays from the heart. He prays with complete honesty. God, he says, I'm drowning. Verse 4, I have more enemies than I have hairs on my head. And I assume he had more hairs than I have. 
They're attacking me with lies, he says. Down in verse 7, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. God, this is happening because I serve you. I'm suffering because I am faithful to your commands. One of the lessons I have learned from these psalms of imprecation is that I can be honest with my prayer. If I need to open up about my hurts, there is no better place to do it than in prayer. We tend to do the opposite. We share our hurts with people in conversation, and then we pray pious prayers. David teaches us to do the opposite. Be very careful in my conversation with others, and then be completely honest in my prayers. Along with being honest about his pain, David is honest about his own failures. Listen to verse 5 and 6. Oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. O oh Lord God of hosts, let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O oh God of Israel. There's no sense here of, God, you know I'm completely in the right and they're completely in the wrong. He recognizes. He has his own failures. He has his blind spots. One reason that it helps to take my concerns to God in prayer is that prayer forces me to confront my own failures. You see, if I start to talk to you about those who have wronged me, I'm going to try to show you that I am completely right. They are completely wrong. But when I talk to God, I'm talking to someone who knows me. He knows the times I have failed. He knows those I have hurt. And so my complaints about my enemies are balanced with an honest confession. Oh God, you know my folly. Have you ever, ever been praying about a situation? A situation in which someone wronged you. And as you were praying, you began to see. You know, my attitude wasn't quite right. Lord, I probably shouldn't have said that. All right, Lord, I went too far in that statement. And soon you are praying with David, Lord, the wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. When the bad guys are winning, prayer forces me to confront my own weaknesses. David starts by showing us to be honest in our prayers. Then after he brings the situation to God, the second thing that David does is he makes his request. Lord, this is what I need. Verse 13, I need to feel your steadfast love, your saving faithfulness. Verse 13, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love. Answer me in your saving faithfulness. God, I know you are faithful. Right now it's hard to see, but I need to see your steadfast love. I need to be delivered. Verse 14, deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me de be delivered from my enemies from the deep waters. Verse 16 and 17, I need to be rescued. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. When you read this word answer in the Psalms, it is almost never a verbal response from God. It is an action. When God answers his people, it means he takes action on their behalf. David is crying out, God, I need to see you in this situation. Verse 18, I need to feel that you are near. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ra ransom me because of my enemies. We saw this when we looked at the book of Job. We see it again here. Our great need in times of trouble is to know that God is near. David's prayer is a great example for us in times when we're hurting. It moves our attention from our enemies to our God. You see, if I'm not careful, my, time, my prayers when I'm hurting can be focused entirely on my enemies. I can begin to think, look how strong they are, look how weak I am, and it seems hopeless. 
But David reminds me to lift my eyes from those who oppose me to look at the power of God to deliver me. The third thing that I see in this psalm is that when the bad guys are winning, David teaches me to turn my case over to God. We just read where he, he gives his trouble. He says, Lord, this is what I think you should do. And his recommendation is very blunt. Look at verse 22. This is what David asked God to do. Let their own table before them become a snare. When they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. God, give them exactly what they deserve. Verse 27, add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. David is convinced that these enemies are not only his enemies, but they're enemies of God. So he doesn't hesitate to call down God's judgment. David believes in the principle of sowing and reaping. Let them reap what they have sown. Psalm 109, he prays, he loved to curse, let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing. May it be far from him. Biblical justice. We reap what we sow. Even that shocking prayer against the Babylonians that I read at the beginning. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Is based on the principle of sowing and reaping. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. The Babylonians had murdered innocent Jewish babies, and the psalmist says, justice demands recompense. And here in Psalm 69, David cries out for justice. But he doesn't stop there. After saying, Lord, this is what I think justice demands. This is what I think you should do. David submits to God's sovereign control. Verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. And then he continues with three verses of praise. This, it seems to me, is the crucial climax of these biblical prayers of imprecation after calling down judgment on his enemies the psalmist end with faith in God they say God I'm going to trust you to do what is right I'm going to surrender the last word to you I won't take vengeance to myself you see this in David's own life when he had the opportunity to kill Saul David refused to take matters into his own hands. He could have rationalized, I've been anointed king, God has rejected Saul, and now God has delivered him into my hands. It's time for me to take action. But instead, he left justice to God. We see this in Nehemiah. Sanballat is the enemy of Israel, the enemy of Nehemiah, the enemy of God. So when Sanballat begins opposing the work, Nehemiah prays a prayer of imprecation. Nehemiah 4, turn back their on their own heads. Give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captive. Do not cover their guilt. Let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. God, this is what I think you should do. You need to punish them. But the next verse says, so we built the wall. He finishes his prayer, he leaves Sanballat to God, and he gets back to the job God has given him to do. And here is the lesson for us today. When the bad guys are winning, I can bring my complaint to God, and then I say, God, I trust you to do what is right. I will praise you regardless of how you choose to respond. 
You see, the biblical response to the enemy who hurts me is to turn my need for justice over to God. Then, if God chooses to bring judgment, it is his vengeance, not my own. And if God chooses mercy, I will praise him that he is a merciful God. This is where Jonah failed. He wanted to see Nineveh destroyed, and he was angry when God had mercy. But when we pray the Psalms of imprecation, when we say, God, look at what they have done to me. What are you going to do? We must rejoice if God shows mercy. We must realize they are receiving the same mercy we've received, and that should bring us joy. I've come to believe that the Psalms of imprecation help us in a very practical way to forgive those who wrong us. You see, it can be hard to forgive when I don't feel that justice has been done. But when I can say, God, this is what they did. This is what I think justice demands. But now, God, I am turning it over to you. And I will trust you to do what is right. Now I am free of the need for vengeance. The debt is no longer mine. They don't owe me. The debt belongs to God. And he can collect it or he can ignore it. It's his to choose. Phil Yancey said that we face three choices when we're hurt. First, we can seek personal revenge. And that is never the biblical model. Romans 12, 19, Paul says, Beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. We can seek personal revenge. Secondly, we can deny the wrong and pretend it didn't happen. He said many Christians do this. I'll pretend the offense never happened. Or worse, forgiveness is permission to do it again. But that is never taught in Scripture. Scripture is realistic. Sin is sin. And love does not enable a wrongdoer's sin. But the third option is the option we see in these psalms. Entrusting our hurts to God, leaving vengeance to Him. And that leaves us free from the burden of seeking justice on our own. Miroslav Vuf was a uh, theologian from Yugoslavia. And he watched as some of his friends and family were murdered by rebels during the Civil War. And during that time, he said he began to pray these psalms of imprecation in his devotional times. And they helped him see how to forgive his enemy. This is what he wrote. The message of these psalms became this. By placing my hurts before God, I placed both my enemy and my own self face to face with a God who loves and a God who does justice. And in the light of the justice and love of God, the seed was planted for the miracle of forgiveness. Over the last several years, I've gone from struggling with these psalms, thinking how do they fit, to a great appreciation for their realistic approach to the hurts of life. There are prayers that help us deal with scars when we've been wronged. They tell us, bring our hurts to God with complete honesty. You don't have to hide it. You can be honest with God. Second, make your request to God. But then, turn it over to God and say, God, I trust you to do what is right. 